clear of the now what? And I think it's not any more clear than Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of work, result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. And so this morning, we'll break down that passage for just a minute. First of all, we're going to look at our salvation is by grace. Really, those seven words could be the could be the best seven words in the Bible. I mean, they really could be. It's for by grace. I mean, because if, if the Bible would have said it's by works, you're saved, and then I see that God demands perfection, then I'm in bad shape. But boy, I praise the Lord for that verse. It's just by grace that God would give me and you something that we could never earn or deserve. Just because of his grace that he did it. It's only by his grace. Rabbis were once asked a question, why does God love us? And their answer was this, he loves us because he loves us. Because if you can put anything in that blank beside that, it's wrong. He loves us because we're lovable. He loves us because we've got a lot going on. He loves us because we're so nice. He loves us because we do so good for him. He loves us because he needs us. He loves us because we're so um, kind and considerate and sinless. No, there's nothing we can put in that blanket set that he loves us because he loves us, and that's his grace. See, we just leave it at that. And it does upset me many times when I see denominations that teach a doctrine that says you can lose your salvation. Because it, to me, it kind of stabs this verse in the heart because it's all by grace. If there was something I could do to lose it, there must have been something I did to gain it or to gain it back. But it's all by grace. I love that principle of not losing it. You see, I can lose my home. I can lose my job. I can lose my health. I can lose everything because nothing's guaranteed. But I praise the Lord, there's one thing in my life I can count on that I can't lose my salvation. I mean, that's such a glorious thing that so many bad things could happen, and that's one thing I can hang on to. And the reason I can, because it's by grace. And then it says it's by faith. That simply means that's the avenue that I get it. It's there, it's a gift, and my connection is faith, my commitment to, my belief in, my trust in what he's already done. And then, of course, Salvation is a gift. Many theologians have wrestled about that it, and that not of herself, it is a gift of God. Theologians said, is it the salvation or is it the faith? Well, based on some scholars who've looked at it, it more than likely from based on the passage and how it's broke down, it is both faith and salvation. God gave me the faith to believe and God gave me the salvation. He gave me both of those as a gift. It's the whole kit and caboodle. I didn't even get the faith. He gave me the faith to be able to get the salvation. So it's all a gift. And then it says right there why he gave it so that no one would boast. Can you believe if it even was by works? Which it's not. But if it was, how church services would be when you'd fellowship in your group. Hey, I ministered to a hundred homeless people. You only did 20. You know, I've been teaching Sunday school for 20 years. You've only been teaching for 10. There would be a kind of a boasting. Why? Because it would be how well you work would be how well you got up there. But we can't boast. We can't boast about the faith. Why? Because he gave us that as a gift. We can't boast about the salvation because that was a gift. There's no boasting at all. There's no bragging about anything. Why? Because it's a gift. You don't brag about a gift. It'd be like me giving you a car and then you going around telling everybody how hard you worked to buy it. You know, if I gave it to you, don't go around telling everybody that you worked hard to get it. It was a gift. Say it was a gift. And that's the way it is with salvation. And then the last thing he mentions, say, Brother Tim, you're on the last point already? Whoa. Well, the last point's one that's going to take us the longest because it does have a purpose to it. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, and there's a reason there, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
You see that word workmanship, which you've heard before, is from the Greek word pomea, which is where we get the word poem. I thought it was neat to see the definition of, of poem. It says, a verbal composition designed to convey expression, idea, or emotions in a vivid and an imaginative way. Isn't that what God, He's working in us. We are His workmanship. We are really His poem. He's writing stanzas in our life. He sometimes is making changes in those stanzas to say, you know what, this will rhyme better. Your life will mean more even by putting in a few negatives because even as a r rhyme and rhythm of a poem goes up and down, so our life has a little rhythm to it. Sometimes it has a big rhythm to it. There's some pretty big drops, some hard times. But God takes all of that rhythm and rhyme and he makes it into a workmanship because he's making us. You see, Lazarus was illustrative of that, I believe. There are three things if you break down Lazarus' life, you can break it down three ways. First of all, he was dead. And when he was dead, Jesus made this command, come forth, or no, he actually said Lazarus come forth or been wiped out the grave. He said his name and come forth. That was his salvation. He was dead, I mean not literal, but a picture of salvation. He was dead and by those words, he was now alive. And then Jesus said, loose him, because he had been bound up with grave clothes already. Loose him. You know, in salvation we get loosed from our sin, we get freed from our bondage. And then you know what Jesus said? Let him go. In other words, he's got something to do. That's our good works. Now we're free to go do something for good works. We have an opportunity now to serve our master who's the one who raised us from the dead spiritually, who did a work in us by loosing us all from those sins, and now we have something to do, which is good works. You know, those works that he says, they are good. There are those things he says in that passage, it's for good works. You say, Brother Tim, make up your mind. Is it works or non-works? You start out saying no works, now you're saying works. Well, it's the cart before the horse. There's no work I can do for salvation. It's all by grace. But once true grace comes into my life, it will generate works. You see, works cannot produce salvation, but salvation for sure will produce works. It was John Calvin who said, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. It will have works that accompany it. You know, I could have gave you a lot of passages, but I'm just gonna give you a few here that illustrate this. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Why? So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance. Why am I gonna get an abundance from God? For every good deed. That's why I even have abundance, for a reason. Second Timothy says, so that, speaking about the word of God, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Titus says it this way, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are what? Zealous for good works. That's the description of a Christian. And then Philippians. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we have something to do. When we say save now what, the what is we have work to do. Not work for it to get salvation, but work after it. Wow, we're finding our purpose. You know, if I were to find somebody that was in a third world country and they came here, never seen any kind of technology, and they came here at an early age, let's say at 20, and I gave them, I said, look, this is called a cell phone. I want to give this to you. And I give it to them, and let's say they kept it for 30, 40 years, and they're on their deathbed, and I go to visit them, and uh, they said, man, I appreciate that cell phone device that you gave me. That's the best clock I ever had. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you handed it to me and said, here's a cell phone. And boy, it had a great clock and that clock kept time all the time. And I really appreciate that. I said, did you use it for anything else? And they said, no, it was, I thought that's all it was for. I said, did you know that that device would make calls? You could call people and talk or you could hear them and they could hear you. I didn't know that. 
and said, you could type on this and you could send that, what's called a text to somebody else and they could send a message back to you. I didn't know that. And you could look up on this device information on a thing called a web and you can look up all kind of information on it. Well, I didn't know that. When you handed it to me, you said, here's a cell phone. I didn't know its purpose. I said, well, you missed out on a lot in life. You could have really used this thing if I would explain to him or her the purpose. This cell phone has a purpose and we as Christians have a purpose. Yes, it's to love God, but it's also to serve God because he lays these things out that we are zealous for good works. You know, Jesus, when he gave the parable about the kingdom, he talked about giving 10 of his slaves, that's this person in this parable, gave 10 of his slaves, he gave them 10 minas each, and he said to them, do business until I come back. He was given the illustration about the kingdom. Jesus left, he's going to come back, and really Jesus' words would be these two words, do business. Because that was the parable Jesus spoke about. He said, I'm going to give all of my employees 10 minas, that's the amount of money. And they were supposed to take this money that he gave them all and do business, whether it was investments, putting in the bank and drawing interest, buying a business and then hiring employees and making money. It was all to make a profit so that when this man came back, he would have profit to show from all of his employees. And Jesus was saying, this is what the kingdom's like. Go do business. Isn't that, we're kind of like hired into the Jesus company. We get hired at salvation. You know what, what if you got hired, it was your first day on the job, they hired you and then at the end of that first week, they kind of came into your office and they said, you know what, we hired you last week and you've been here for a week, but you know, from what we can gather, we don't see that you've done anything. He said, I hadn't. They said, all we think you've done is just sit in your office and just sit. And he said, I have. And there he said, well, is there any reason maybe you hadn't done anything? Well, everything you have asked me to do sounds like work. So why did you get hired? He said, you have to understand this. When I get hired at this company, my name is on the roll of this company. And I wanted to get my name on the employment roll. Because when I get my name on the employment roll, an official employee, I get an official badge that gives me entrance to this company. And I get a 401k, I get a salary, I get retirement, I get a company car, and I get a week at the Colorado Lodge that the company owns. And that's why you got hired? Yeah, I just got hired for all these benefits. I didn't sign up for work. And they said, well, you can sign up for one other thing. It's pink, you know, the sign right here because you'd be out the door. Why? Because they hired you not for just the benefits and you do get benefits from an employer, but you do have something to do. And we hired on at the Jesus Company. Praise the Lord, he hired us by grace. We didn't have anything on our resume. But once he did, he does expect us to go to work in the kingdom, to do business till he returns. And when he returns, that's what he's going to hold us responsible for. And that's what he held these guys responsible for because we have some work ahead. The last part of that verse is highlighted there that we hadn't covered. Not only was his workmanship, that means what he's working inside us to make us all that we need to be. It says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I began to think about this as I studied. The salvation he gave me, I mean the faith he gave me for salvation, he gave me that. He gave me the salvation and now he's already preparing the work for me ahead of time. Do you catch that? He prepared it beforehand. He prepared what? It says that. Which, that is those good works which God prepared beforehand. You know, I can go home and prepare a meal, but I've got to chop the onions, I've got to get out the recipe, I've got to cook it and stir it and boil it and put it all together, and then I can eat it. But boy, when I go to a restaurant, they prepare it beforehand. That when I order it, they prepare it, and as long as I know how to use a fork, which I do, that's all I, that's, 
That's all that's really required. It's just knowing how to use a fart. The rest of it just works out fine. I'm a happy camper. I would rather have things prepared beforehand for me. God's done this. He's already even done that. Where there's no excuse, he's done it beforehand. He's given me what I need to do to be able to serve him. Even that has been part of his plan. Then why don't we serve him? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Here are some excuses. It's not the right time. I'm too busy. And boy, that's true for all of us. I just didn't know how busy adulthood was going to be or I probably wouldn't as a kid saying, I wish I could hurry up and grow up. It's busy. It's busy for all of us. And there's never enough time. There's never enough time, but we have to make the time. A lot of people will say, you know, after high school, when I get everything done, uh, I'm going to serve the Lord. And then they get in college and maybe it's a lot going on and they said, man, if I can just finish this college deal, then I can really serve the Lord. And then they get that first job and get married and with kids and say, man, if I can just get the promotion and get the kids grown, then there's going to be some time I'll serve the Lord. And, and then they're saying, man, it, I just get in this promotion. There's more responsibility. So when I get through with that, it'll be okay. And then when retirement happens, then I'll really have some time to serve the Lord. And then they retire and they said, man, I'm having a few health issues now. And so as soon as these health issues are up, then I'm going to serve the Lord. And then you know what happened next, the funeral. You know, it's just, there's not going to be, it's like money. You have to budget it. And it's just not going to show up. So that excuse is one that we all face. You know, I'm reminded, I won't mention their name, of somebody that's actually here at this campus who uh, worked on Sundays. And they just were trying so hard to not work on Sundays. And, I, you know, you begin to think, you know, I wonder if somebody did get off on Sundays, if you would use it for what they were praying for it for. Because a lot of people are off on Sundays and then they use it for themselves. And it was such a blessing to see that when this person finally had their employer say, you're off, they're as faithful as clockwork. Because they wanted to serve the Lord. And that was the only thing happening. And they made that th deal to make it happen. You know, another thing is, I have too many trials and difficulties right now. And that's a lot of people. We all are not, all of us are, none of us are exempt from trials and difficulties. And you can't wait necessarily for those to be away because it seems like they're always there. And you can't wait for those to completely go away because you'd be waiting for a long time because at one level or another, they're always there. You know, this passage in Romans says, we quote it quite often telling people who are going through difficulties. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. And we usually stop there, many of us. But then it goes on to give a disclaimer. To those who love God, that's one. And to those who are called according to his purpose. That's what that goes for. He'll work it all out to good. If you love God, and I believe you're using it for his purpose, that if we're not called according to his purpose, and we're discovering that even as we're mentioning in this sermon, we're seeing purpose. It kind of fits into this next verse in 2 Corinthians, who God who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort we ourselves are comforted of God. Did you catch that? He comforts us in our affliction so that. Oh, he doesn't just comfort us so we can be comforted? That's not what this verse says. He says he has a reason to comfort us so that we can comfort other people. He said, well, I hadn't been doing that. Well, may God will have to send you through another affliction because that's how we're supposed to come out on the other end, aren't we? Say, hey, don't send me through another one. You sent me through that one so that I could use what I did to comfort other people so you know, a lot of people go through summer school. God said, are you doing it now? Mm -mm. Well, let's go through summer school again. Are you doing it now? Mm -mm. Well, I told you I'm, I'm, I'm comforting you for a reason so that you'll be able to minister to other people. Well, I'm not going to do it. All right, let's try it this time. You know, I wonder if one of those things would be able to say, you know, now obviously not all affliction comes for that reason. There's, there's all kind of reasons.
God just sometimes for the grace of God and glory of God. But there are some that fit into this category of that. So difficulties are part of what we're serving the Lord for. And then I really don't have any abilities. You know, I used to catch myself saying, well, the Lord will use you in what you can do, not what you can't do. And, and that's, that's not not true. But the more I've thought about it, I don't want to even say that anymore. The Lord may use you in what you can't do because he saves you. You can't save yourself. He gives you the pre, he works beforehand to give you the works. Even if you can't do it, he'll do it for you because I mean, that's how a God he is. It may be something you don't know how to do, can't do, never wanted to do, never could do. And God says, okay, I'm gonna let you do that. And he gets even more glory. So it's, you don't even have to have the abilities. He gives them to you because he's already, everything he's called you to do, he's already prepared beforehand. So just, and you notice that, that verse didn't say work in them. It said walk in them. He said he prepared them beforehand that you would walk in them, not work in them. Oh, Brother Tim, I am just trying to serve the Lord. No, just walk in them. He's already prepared it. That's his purpose for you to just walk in what he's already prepared for you. He's done all the preparation. Just walk in that. And then God has other people, let him use them. And that's what happens a lot in churches. Brother Tim, everything's going on pretty good now. The lights are on, everything's cooking pretty good today. Obviously somebody's serving. Just let them keep going. I'll pray for them. Well, that's true. I mean, I mean, obviously we're here today and church is moving forward, but are you missing something? Not is everybody else missing something. I like this passage. Matter of fact, the theme of our church is in this passage. Esther. Mordecai has related this to Esther. He says to her, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. See, she has the opportunity, Esther does, to save her people. She has to go before the king, her husband, and be able to be used by God. But it could be dangerous if he doesn't invite and she gets killed doing it. So she's leery if she wants to just stay silent about this. And Mordecai's related to her. Say, girlfriend, you can stay quiet. You don't have to do this. Because God can find somebody else to do it. That's what he's saying. He can find it. He's going to deliver them. It may be from another place. He may not use you. He'll use somebody else. You know what she would have, could have said? Whew, then let him go ahead and use somebody else. Um, well, that's good news. Praise the Lord for Scripture. You know, let somebody else do it then. If somebody else can do it and somebody else wants to do it and I don't want to, let them go do it. And then he says this. And if you and your father's, but, and you and your father's house will perish. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> so, I mean, and then this last part I love, and that's part of the church's theme here. And who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this. You remember how she got to this position? She kind of won the beauty pageant. And Mordecai might have been saying this. Listen, Prissy. I added that. He didn't say that. But don't get too Prissy. You didn't get beautiful on your own. You weren't in the womb thinking, you know what? I think I'm going to come out gorgeous. And one day I'm going to grow up gorgeous. You know, God did that. And God got you promoted up to this top spot as queen. You didn't do that on your own. So you better watch that what you got and obtained, which is royalty, you might have got that for a reason. For such a time as this, you got it. You got your royalty, you got your jewels, you got your promotion, you got your money, you got all that, and it's not for you, it's for this time to be used by God. Prissy. Because she could have just took it and said, well, I, I got all this, I got my money, I got my jewels. But listen, that wasn't for you. You obtained it for a reason. Do you know that everything you have Everything we have is for such a time as this. Yes, some of it we get to use for us. I mean, even Queen Esther was still enjoying the palace. 
I mean, don't get me wrong. She still was having a great time having all this luxury. And it isn't that God is not just robbing that some of this stuff doesn't bring us enjoyment. But if it's just for us and we're not using some of our time, talent, and treasure for service for such a time as this, it's not for tomorrow, it's for today. Because for such a time as this, it may not happen tomorrow. We may not be alive tomorrow. Because everything we've obtained, we got from God. Do you notice the time is from God? When he says, shut off the ticker, that time's gone. So it's he's the only one that's keeping the ticker ticking. And talent, anything you have there, you got from God. And treasure, he can shut that off tomorrow too. Either no job or health could be taken away. So time, talent, and treasure, still all those three are gifts. So we see God's just loaded us up to be able to serve him and to love him. You know, I came across this passage because blessings are tied to the work too. When we minister, there is blessing. I believe God ties blessing and ministry together. It, it may take sacrifice, yes. It'll sacrifice some time, talent, and treasure, yes. But there's blessing tied to it. Isaiah starts out this way, and if you, see now there's an if. There are ifs in scripture. If, and then I'm gonna skip this part. I'm gonna come back to it later. Let's just jump to the blessing, isn't that good? Let's just jump to the blessing. What does it say? It says this. Then, once you do it, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. Well, that sounds like if I'm kind of depressed and down and a little gloomy, God say, I'll brighten you up. You'll be as bright as the noonday. You'll be like a light bulb. I'll be happy, happy, happy. You see, because he's, he's kind of turned on, off my gloom. You ever get gloomy? I do something. I just, it can, you can be right in the middle of blessing and boy, boom, gloom. I mean, just like, where'd that come from? You know, we start looking at what we don't have. We start, we can get into gloom. Said, but if you do this, boy, I'm going to turn your darkness into gloom. You'll become like a midday sun. I like that. The next one, verse 11. And the Lord will continually guide you. Well, I don't know about you, but I need that big time. There's so many decisions in life. Gosh, just daily, big ones, little ones. Boy, if God could just guide me in those things where he could show, because he's already been in the future, so he knows what I ought to do because he's already there and he can say, do this because you don't know what's happening down there. You may make the wrong decision, but since I've already been down there, I'll guide you because I know the future. Boy, just to have somebody know the future, that's almost like a rigged game. You know what I'm saying? I mean, wouldn't you like somebody that already know the future and give you stock market tips and insider trading? I mean, that'd be great. But the Lord, he's already been in the future. He can guide me. And then it says, and he'll satisfy your desire in scorched places. Well, that's good. Meaning I go through some scorched places sometime and the Lord's going to satisfy my desire in those scorched places. And he'll give strength to your bones. Because whatever fits in this little gap that I left out, he's going to give me strength to do that. In other words, whatever it is going to be, he'll give me the strength in my physical health to be able to do what it is he mentioned in that little gap. And then he says this, and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Well, that's picturesque. I don't know what all that means, but that's good. I want that. I want to be whatever that, I mean, like a watered garden and like a spring of waters whose water, do not, I know this is probably the wrong season to be mentioning this with all the rain, but when you're in a scorched place, like that year we were drought, you'd think, oh, that sounds good. Just have a little water. Not a scorched garden, but a watered garden. You say, Brother Tim, if you don't hurry up and click that clicker where we can see what's in that gap, we're going to throw our Bibles at you. Because that's something we want to all sign up for in the lobby. That's an insurance policy that we like all those clauses, all those guarantees. We want that. Well, let's look and see what he said. 
If you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, you know what that is? Ministry. That's ministry. Whatever it is, you're out there ministering to people and serving the Lord and doing the good deeds. They usually fit under, fit under helping somebody. Oh, but that word if. He didn't say you're going to get it. He said if. Oh, Lord, you mean I may miss out on that package? Not me. Say, Brother Tim, that sounds kind of selfish. No, the Lord rewards those. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, the Bible says. And so that's Him we're rewarding. I want to be part of that package. I want to serve the Lord. I want to wrap up by reading this because I came across it. It's by Rusty Stevens. I used it years ago. I, just the way he says it because this happened to him, Rusty Stevens, and he wrote this down, and I'm just going to read it as he wrote it. As I feverishly pushed the lawnmower around our yard, I wondered if I would ever finish before dinner. Mikey, our six-year-old son, walked up and without even asking, stepped in front of me and placed his hands on the mower handle. Knowing that he wanted to help me, I quit pushing. The mower quickly slowed to a stop. Chuckling inward at his struggles, I resisted the urge to say, get out of here, kid, you're in my way. I said instead, here, son, I'll help you. As I resumed pushing, I bowed my back and leaned forward and walked spread leg to avoid colliding with Mikey. The grass cutting continued, but more slowly and less efficiently than before because Mikey was helping. Suddenly, tears came to my eyes as it hit me. This is what my heavenly father, this is the way my heavenly father allows me to help him build his kingdom. I picture my heavenly father at work, seeking, saving, and transforming the lost. And there I was with my weak hands helping. My father could do the work by himself, but he doesn't. He chooses to stoop graciously to allow me to co-labor with him. Why? For my sake. Because he wants me to have the privilege of ministering with him. Oh, Brother Tim, that work stuff seems like such hard work. That's the wrong perspective. We all get into that rut sometimes, thinking, Lord, I, I'm tired. I just don't want to do this anymore. But we change our perspective when we look at it the way Rusty Stevens looked. It's a privilege. God's doing the work and we get to come alongside him to serve with him, to get the blessings of Isaiah 58, to get the blessings of having the privilege to minister alongside him, to take the question that we started with, saved, what now? Salvation is the beginning I don't think people sometimes put enough importance maybe on works. It should never have the importance on this end because it'll never get salvation, but it ought to have importance on the other side of how we have the privilege to work with God in whatever capacity he calls us to because we're all a body. Jesus is the head and we're the body parts. Just if you're a hand, just do some hand stuff. If you're a foot, just do foot stuff. If you're an elbow, you're probably going to do something to assess people with hands, you know, and Jesus is the head directing it all. But what happens is, in our own physical body, if we have a couple of body parts that are still not working like they should, you know what that does? It affects the whole body, doesn't it? Because the body kind of now is a little more taxed because that arm's in a sling or that leg's broke or, you know, it just has to work a little harder. God wants the whole body to serve, not only for the sake of the body, for your own blessing. 
to be able to have those things because I've even told people who've come in and been depressed, I say, man, just find somebody to serve. That'll take some of the gloom away right there. And that's kind of what Isaiah is saying. Man, I'll take away the gloom because you're involved in serving the Lord. Let's stand to your feet with every head bowed and every eye closed.